Welcome to the Innovation in Higher Education podcast, where we share the diverse views and perspectives of experts in higher education, innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship from all around the world on topics related to the future of higher education and the future of work in an engaging, fresh, friendly, and very human format. Let's get started. Hello, welcome to a new episode of the Innovation in Higher Education podcast. My name is Viviana Rojas, and I will be your host for today. Today, we have a very special guest. We are here with Sean Branagan. He's a director of the Center for Digital Media Entrepreneurship and professor for media innovation and entrepreneurship at the Newhouse School of Public Communication at Syracuse University, which he always says is the best university in media communications in the US. Um, hi, Sean, how are you? It's very nice to have you Viviana, here. Viviana, thank you for having me on the on the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be talking to you too. I'm excited to you know, I live for this stuff. Yes. <laughs> Okay, great. So let's dive into the topic. The topic of today would be entrepreneurship education and specifically the barriers to entrepreneurs. Um, yeah. And there are a um, lot of barriers to entrepreneurs. Some of them are in our head, some of them are in the environment and a whole bunch of others. Uh, so yeah, I'm happy to get into that. Great. So I will start with a question from your experience uh, teaching entrepreneurship, uh, especially in digital media. How, what are, what is the sense, what, what is the feeling that you get from students that are into this program or that are taking these courses? Uh, well, it's changed a bit. Uh, when I first started in 2011, um, there was this feeling of who's going to be the next Zuckerberg, you know, the next Zuck okay. is what I would try to say. Oh, I'm going to go off and build this gigantic company. And that has transitioned more uh, with our Gen Z students, I'm finding, especially our undergrad students, but also our grad students more and more are wanting to build a more impactful, personally fulfilling business. And they at first don't see entrepreneurship. It sounds too big. It sounds too highfalutin as my mom would say. Uh, and so I have to kind of break that down and say, no, no, no it's, a, it's the same as your auntie who goes off and opens up a shop. She's an entrepreneur. <laughs> and those it, <laughs> it takes a lot of guts to do it. Yeah. And it's the same, you know, whether you're going and starting what could end up being a mammoth technology company or a small business, it's the same, it's, it's in many ways, it's the same kinds of uh, mechanisms and per, interpersonal uh, drive. So uh, that's one thing that I've seen that's changed. Uh, I've been very lucky. Um, our school, like I like I was telling you, we're we're top school. We get top students, which is why we're a top school. Um, you and, have you have a, a like a long list of uh, really uh, highlight uh, highlights. Yeah, we have some uh, amazing alumni. alum alums that have come out of our school and gone on and started things, or they're running uh, organizations. Uh, but one of the things that uh, that I do with the students, because you're asking about yeah. what have I seen that the students are doing, I've learned uh, two really important things from the students. One is, uh, and I always knew this, but it they make me emphasize it, and I'm glad is it. This is the failure business. Starting businesses, they fail, and you know to say, oh well, I took Sean's course, and therefore I'm not going to fail, would be a flat out lie. Uh, do I think it'll increase your likelihood of succeeding? Yeah, a little, but it's still the failure business. But they don't fail. The students don't fail. Their careers are sensational. And I think I said that in our in the presentation that you were in, is that, yes, their little venture that they had while they were in my classes didn't make it. And, you know, that's sad and they're crying and, you know, all those things that we all do, like, well, we miss it. It was but they're changed forever. And they go off to in sensational roles. Now that I've been doing this for 10 years, I keep in touch with quite a few. One is, uh, she just left her role uh, at the White House. Okay. As the, uh, yeah, so she's high, you know, and this is a couple years out of school. One is running uh, the Washington Post uh, TikTok. Uh, she just graduated, it feels like 45 minutes ago. Uh, that's how I I think it's a year or two, yeah. but <laughs> it, feels, it feels like she was just here. Uh, and others are off on the in these sensational roles and jobs, or they're running something else completely different. So the idea that you have to start this venture and it has to succeed in order that you succeed, I separate that. 
And I really emphasize it because the students have said, you need to emphasize this, that this venture put your heart and soul into it, but it isn't your heart and soul. Your heart and soul is separated. That's you. And, uh, and that's one thing. And then the other one is the panel that you saw is mm -hmm. I started seeing more, uh, I'm an old white guy, just, you know, put it on the record, put it out there. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, white men in this venturing and the entrepreneurship thing. And it sort of perpetuates itself. Oh, the venture funders are, give money to someone who looks like them, et cetera, et cetera, and all those things, which we can get into or to barriers. But the mm -hmm. other barrier is, um, is that we have this mythology about what an entrepreneur is and has to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's part of my teaching. And apparently yeah. it hit an audience that defied the demographics of my our student population. We have about 65% uh, women and somewhere in the 15 to 20% people of color. Mm -hmm. And my classes, I've had one class, I like to say I have had now two classes where there was one dude you know, one guy, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was all women. And uh, and other classes where I have well over 50% of the population are people of color. And, and I've started asking them, this is probably about five, six years ago, maybe longer. I asked them, why are you taking my class? And they want to do a movie or write a book or cover news that's not being covered because they're learned, they're, you know, their lived experience uh, isn't being fulfilled. And that gets them motivated to come to a school like ours. And then they learn, I'm going to have to pitch this to some executive after I'm three to five years, maybe in the, and I tell them, don't wait, just launch it now, do it. Um, and what's the harm? You got nothing to lose, really. Yes. You, have no, you have no career, so that's I think that's a great mentality. I think, like, um, I've also taught uh, back in Peru, uh, not entrepreneurship, but I've taught project management and digital project yeah. management, and I always encourage my students, if you want to try something, do it now. Nobody cares. Now. You're right. at university. <laughs> this, yeah. you know, like, this is the best time to fail. Like, nobody is going to yeah, look at you wrong or anything. A bad right. grade is harmless. You know? Exactly. The, and, and most of the time a, a, a professor who's who's worth their salt you know as the saying goes will realize that that was a much bigger uh, a much bigger benefit for them to have tried something even if it you know fails by whatever that metric metric is uh if it fails who ca who cares you learned yes. If learning is the objective, you learn more in a failure than you do in a success. Way more. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> One thousand <laughs> times more in a failure. Let the failing begin, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think when we talk about entre entrepreneurship, is that failure is unavoidable. You are going to fail. And yeah, one important is. thing that should be taught in entrepreneurship education is how to manage failure. And I think more, more and, and even how more to learn from it. How to manage success, like how to manage yeah. failure, really, because totally. it's going to come. <laughs> Yeah. And um, yeah, so that's part of the mythology, too, is like it's like uh, it's uh, bifurcated, right? Like all the people who succeeded, they're the really smart entrepreneurs. You know what? I've known I know them. Some of them are. Some of them are not. Yeah, I will say that. <laughs> the other side of it is unbelievably smart, insightful, thoughtful, caring people who then started something and it didn't succeed, but they succeed. And that, that actually is much more of a great story I love uh, uh, are the ones who went down that path. And they learn more by the failure, I think, is part of it. I, I'm not going to say one caused the other because I have no I have no research to prove that. So, uh -huh. again, shout out to anybody who wants to research this is. Yeah, but that you see you see what happens when they go through that hard thing of oh this is this dear thing and i thought the market would care okay the market didn't care or they didn't <laughs> they care didn't. enough or they didn't pay enough money to make it yeah. so that you could keep doing the thing that you okay so let's put it down let's take the learnings and let's go do something else and they it it blows my mind what they end up going and doing and i think they are so changed by it it's it should be taught more I agree with you 100%. And that that leads us a bit to the barriers, right? Uh I think it's it's uh it's a good pathway to talk now about the barriers to entrepreneurship because 
I think this is uh, what you were mentioning. No, you have some you have some students that at the end succeed, some others that don't succeed. What uh, what are these um, factors uh, besides besides? Of course, the market is a big factor. You cannot predict the market in this case. But are, would you say from your experience that there are some underlying factors that also could in some way like uh, predict failure or success? I'm going to give you three, and I don't think it predicts failure or success so much as it just changes. And predicts is not, the, yeah, you're right. Yeah, predicts, it changes. Predicts is not the right word. It's like it, that could, you know, like push the balance. Yeah, towards, yeah, you know, yeah. Like yeah. So, no, that you were right to say that because that again, shout out to any researchers because there's plenty of opportunities here. But uh, so I'm going to give you one that's in your in the head of mm -hmm. students and just generally people is mm -hmm. we have this mythology about entrepreneurs, that they're smarter, they can see around corners, that they uh, they saw a vision and then they went for that vision. They had uh, a dream. And then, <laughs> right, right. You know, the other yeah. one is you bring the successful, well, uh, financially uh, successful, especially person, and they'll come in and they'll say, follow your dream. Well, that's really easy to say mm -hmm. if you've succeeded, right? <laughs> it's really hard. And all the sort of the mythology of entrepreneurs, because if you close your eyes and picture them and they don't look like you, well, that takes you out of it. So that's the diversity angle. The other one is, oh, they have to know all this stuff and they have to, no, 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 they, no, you don't. And in fact, when you then meet them and start talking to them, they will say things like, I didn't even know what I was doing. They're almost apologetic because <laughs> they're at, my school talking to my students and I'll say, so tell me about your business plan. And they'll go, I didn't have a business plan. I know I didn't do it right. And then I tell them, okay, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you full academic forgiveness. And I'm going to tell you, you don't need a business plan. <laughs> In fact, many, if not every single one of the, of the uh, entrepreneurs I've invited over the years to talk, will say they didn't really have a plan. They had a sense of direction, they had some elements, and that's actually how entrepreneuring happens. I can only relate. It, <laughs> only it's taught primarily, yeah. sorry business school people out there at the management schools, <laughs> primarily taught as you do a business plan, you think through all this stuff, you do all this very rigorous, love the rigor, love the learned elements of, oh, marketing plan and, um, you know, launch elements and doing customer uh, customer engagement and um, all that product development work. But the truth is, if you spend all that time and instead just go launch, you know, go build the damn thing is uh, one of the books I love telling my students to read, uh, is you learn more in doing the little bit you know how to do. You learn the thing you need to do next because you want to do the next thing. Not because the professor told you or I it's on my, you know, my um, prerequisite for the next course, I have to learn this in order to take that. No, it's they are motivated because it's their <laughs> venture. And so when they say, oh, did you do any market research as a student? They blow me away because they did way more market research than the market research class would have taught them <laughs> because they care. Um, so that's sort of what the mythology that you have to know all these things that it maybe doesn't look like you a whole bunch of myth mythology keeps uh, keeps students from trying it mm -hmm. and therefore not succeeding because they didn't try. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other side is uh, a couple of other elements of mythology that says, oh, you have an idea and then you go get money. Totally wrong. So I teach them the game. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's a game. It's, you know, the venture money does certain kinds of things and they're looking for certain kinds of outputs and outcomes. But there are other ways that you do it. You don't need to have investment. In fact, I tell them, if you can do it without investment, do it. You own it. It's yours. You can make the choices. Uh, but so there's that. And then the next one is, this is, I think, the biggest barrier after somebody graduates. So I try to get them to do it while, like you're saying, do, do it while you're here. You know, you know, 
you know, start a budget. Like, yeah, I, I, I want freshmen and sophomores because then I can get them for more years to kind of work their ventures. There's problems with that, but immaterial. Like I'll get a senior, they'll work the whole year and then they're ready to graduate. And I have to have a moment with them to find out, can they afford to fail? Mm -hmm. That's a reality. I don't want somebody, and this goes back to the, a little bit to the mythology. The mythology is, oh, you have to spend money to make money and you have to take big risks. No, you don't. In fact, you, you shouldn't. Don't. Don't yes, do that. Exactly. Don't do that. You should not Real entrepreneurs don't do that. Yes. Oh, yeah, they did. You know, they put all this money yeah, on their second venture because their first venture gave them the means to uh -huh. take a bigger risk, but they're not taking a risk that knocks everything out. They don't do that generally. There are exceptions, but generally that's that's not the way to do it. So I have to assess and, uh, you know, is this student got the means to allow for failure? And that goes back to their family and their upbringing and financial security. And that's where the biggest barrier is. To me, a lot of these students who go off and really start something, it's because they're lucky enough they have the means to have, allow them to fail. Net. Like they have a safety net, right? If they, exactly. fail, if they fail, they can just, you know, <laughs> they right. fail, they're, safe and they're okay. So, now, so what does that do? That means, especially in my space of the media space, the book publisher is, a, is the child of a rich person. Yeah. Not somebody who came up and, you know, were scrappy and building their, you know, d delivering newspapers when yes. they were a kid. You know, you hear those stories mm -hmm. and there are out there. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the mythology, but most of them are not. Most of them are have, not come, have come from means. Exactly. Like look at Evan. Uh, so the, the and this is not a put down. He's terrific, terrific CEO, great company. Uh, Evan Spiegel of, um, of Snapchat. Uh -huh. His father is a billionaire. <laughs> Yes, yes, very easy no, to it didn't, mean, it didn't mean he did anything wrong. Good on him. Lucky for him. But if that is all we have is entrepreneurs are, are able to only come from wealth, we are we are indeed poor as a society. We need to have entrepreneurs who are who have ways and means. Uh, and this is a bigger problem than I can solve, is that is a huge barrier, is um, the ability to fail. Because you have to be able to fail. You have to be. You the have to be fail, able to. Say, right? Like yeah, you have to have that as, I don't mean it's going to be painless. No, no, no. And I don't mean it's the same as, you know, Richie Rich, <laughs> Richie Rich kid who fails and they're like, oh, it's so bad. And I can't believe this. They say in their lovely overlooking the river apartment. No, it's, it's going to be different, but it, it shouldn't harm the entrepreneur. Um, it, it should be, you can recover from it. That would be my objective, not you make it easy. That would be wrong. Uh, I think that would attract the wrong kind of entrepreneur. It's hard work. Mm -hmm. And then the last one I'll give is, uh, and a lot of conversation about this and I can get into it more and I'd be happy to do that one-on-one -on -one with anybody, but it would just take too long here. We typically point to regulatory and uh, systemic uh, issues that are barriers, such as, oh, it's hard to get investment. All right, I'm going to be the jerk. I'm going to be the capitalist here. It should be hard to get investment. Yes. It, it should be. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's part of why it's, you know, <laughs> uh, professional investors look at 100 ventures before they invest in one. That means a hundred, one out of a hundred, and then out of every ten they invested, professional investors here, out of every ten, only one succeeds. Yes, <laughs> now they anyone's failed. So now I've looked at a thousand businesses, and only one succeeded. This is not about oh, there needs to be more money, and we need to spread it around. That said, I do think there are some mechanisms, and I'm actually so if I can do a shout out to uh, Media O which is the Media Ownership Project, which is a not-for-profit, it's media-o.org uh, that we've started. And one of the things that we're looking at is how do we create mechanisms in the funding model to, 
I, I'm kind of cruel, I, to stop the line. In order for me to get the next round of funding, so I'm one of those 10 that got funded, so I must have something going right, right? Mm -hmm. I beat the odds to get to this point, but still nine of those 10 are going to fail? Yeah, <laughs> they are. And, you know, can we come up with a way to make that, make those odds better? I I don't believe you can because I enough people have been working. At, I mean, there's investors would have said, yeah, we want whoever can beat the, no, those are the odds because there are so many unknown factors, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. It's the nature of entrepreneuring. But Literally. how can I change what success is, is controllable. And what we're looking at is a, um, I've nicknamed it a reverse safe. Um, a safe is a note that's used early on in investment mm -hmm. where the value of the venture isn't determined until later. So okay. I'm going to give money to a venture and not fight about, oh, is it worth this much or that? Who cares? We don't know what it's worth. Let's just be honest. Yes. So I write a paper that says, I will accept whatever the next round indicates is the value. And then I get a position in, in that with money that I've invested. Okay, it's kind of dweeby, techie investor stuff. But that is when the lying begins. Mm -hmm. Because now I went out and I'm looking at a business and if I were to do the math, okay, it's gonna be like a 15 or $20 million business, which most human beings like you and me would go, that, that, that'd be yes. nice. <laughs> investors that's too small uh -huh. it's way too small they don't get the return they need now you can say oh but they should and they're not gonna that's why all those numbers they're willing to do a one in a thousand it has to have such a huge win to make make it worth the next round of investment that's the problem so i've been working with actually it was um uh, Niels Hogsdal in uh, in Stuttgart, who I run it by because he is an economist, I think it is in his core, and, I, and he knows the startup world. And I said, why don't we have a clawback where instead of the next round of funding is what you go after, you increase success rates because you claw back and you say, look, we're going to transform this from an investment to a debt. And you own this potentially $15 million company. And maybe I want you in my region. So I have economic development money that I can tap, or I want a more diverse audience or more diverse owners. So maybe foundation money can help offset this. But before they go off and raise big, big money and have to be a billion dollar or a $20 billion company, which is a lie, <laughs> I'm like, stop the lying. <laughs> I want a t-shirt that says stop the lying. Um, so you say, look, we're, I'm a, I'm a, it could be a $20 billion company. It'd be a 15, it can have 60 employees. It can have, these are lives. Why don't we want that? We do, but the mechanism doesn't allow it. So that's a barrier that I think we could fix. Okay. And I have to uh, ask about the barrier of gender as well. I mean, you, you talked about diversity, but I think we should as well dive a bit into gender because I've been reading a lot of news lately uh, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a topic that is sparkling up every time more as well. Like, um, why is it harder or is it harder from your experience? It is harder. Uh, it is, is harder, it harder for, for women to get investment, to get, uh, to get yeah, opportunities for entrepreneurship regarding funds. Would you say so from your experience or? Yeah, shout out to Kate Brodock. Um, I'm an advisor to the W, uh, to her uh, company that used to be known as Women 2.0. So it was women2.com, uh, mm -hmm. but now it's called Switch. And uh, they have a fund, the W Fund, uh, yeah. where it's women investing in uh, women-owned um, uh, ventures. Okay. And there's more movement here. It's gotten a little bit better, still paltry and bad. Uh, but on the investment side, um, investors are emotional. This okay. is not, I'm not giving an excuse here. I'm giving a reality. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, they're emotional. And therefore, when they're, especially early stage companies, when they're looking at a company, yes, they do the due diligence. Yes, they're assessing, is this a big market? Yes, they're, and that's where they're rational head is, but mm -hmm. 
but their emotional head is, oh, I really like this founder. Oh, yeah. man, this founders are, and they tend to look like you. And so if you look at the investors, they're okay. old I white men and they're looking and putting money into young white men. Okay. And now that they're aware, that's a plus. The next mm -hmm. one is more women getting into the role of being investors because mm -hmm. some of them, uh, a great number of women have high net worth in the United States, but have not been investors like this. Cause ah, well, I don't know that world. Okay, we'll teach you. Or mm -hmm. you learn it by getting into it. Let's go. Uh, you sit on the, on the investment board as a limited partner. You see 55 ventures that came in front of you. And then you say, you looked at a thousand other ones. Yeah. Okay. They now learn. Da, 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 da. And so we're seeing some movement, some positive things there. Not enough, but yes, there are absolutely all kinds of mechanisms that are barriers uh, for women to do this. Uh, the one that I say is don't go and get investment. Why put that in the hands of some old white dude? <laughs> like I say, just go, go build the damn thing. And, yeah. uh, and I, and you know, this is like, okay, now I'm just pushing it back on you. If you say you're going to build it, but I need investment to get it. Make me even more impressed with you as a unstoppable force is what I call it. So how did you build this? I love that question. So how, well, I, you know, stayed up nights and I worked on this and I got a friend to do this. And I'm like, okay, they're unstoppable. Now investment is easier because this is a different emotion. This is an emotion of, oh man, I do not want to miss out because they're going to do it without me. Even old white men will fall for that one. You're going to do it without <laughs> me? Yeah. So, so that one's tough. Um, and then lastly is there's just so many mechanisms uh, around uh, women-owned ventures because the that are that are barriers. Uh, I'll give you an example, and I won't name the name name of the person who said this. Is a friend, and I love him dearly, but I could not believe he said this. We're in a <laughs> we're in a review of a, a venture in a, in a sports tech environment, and the um, it it was for a yoga pants with sensors. So that is somebody holding the right pose huh? and, uh, and he puts his hand up and he says, well, how much would these, would these yoga pants cost? And I can't remember the number, but it was pretty high. And he said, well, who would pay that? I'm like, oh my God. And then he says, I'll have to ask my wife. Oh, dude, please be quiet. You are not capable of asking the question. Therefore, zip it. Mm -hmm somebody thankfully across the room <laughs> who knew okay have you heard of lululemon no you haven't so and so because i'm not going to call out the name and said do you know what their prices are well who would pay that and it doesn't have any sensors and it doesn't and then that person did a follow-up actually i will name who that is um she's the uh, head of innovation for under armor okay yes yes oh. <laughs> a woman and yes she knows this stuff and she knew absolutely people would pay that price. Yes. She then asked the question, are the sensors washable? To which the founder said, yes. She said, let's talk after this meeting <laughs> because oh, that, and that is a gender issue. And it's a gender issue because the man who's deciding whether we're going to partly decide, it was a big room, uh, deciding who gets funded doesn't even understand the experience of the person okay. who's going now go even further. I had somebody else who was texting me during the presentation. I told him to go to, it was for a, um, it was for a, for, in the femtech world. And it was about tracking, um, tracking menstruation. And, uh, and it was going, and he's going, uh, is this like a market? Oh my God, of course. I mean, Are you I can kidding tell you me awkward. even here? Are you kidding me? Do those words even come out of your market, out, out of your mouth? Yes, it's a market that's unseen by you, which I could shame you on, but I'm not gonna because I get it. You don't, you know, you don't buy race cars and you don't buy it. You wouldn't know that market either, but you would be more fascinated with that because you then look at who it is and you, so those are the kinds of barriers that exist, which is just completely, 
unavailable to the people who can decide which ones go forward and which ones don't, whether it's a bank loan or it's an investment or even it, it's an advisory role. You ask someone to advise you on this and they're going, this is a sweet little idea. Thank you so much for inviting. I'll give you some, you know, it's like a pat on the head and, <laughs> and that's just, that's horrible, but it happens all the time. I, I mean, I can totally imagine. I have to ask one more thing following this line of barriers. Um, do you have any experience uh, uh, teaching or giving or, or being involved in uh, developing countries' entrepreneurship ecosystems? Um, yeah, I'm currently advising Estonia, which uh -huh. uh, is quite I good. Something about esports, right? Yeah, we did. Um, that was an offshoot of the bigger arching thing is we're at the start of what is being called the creator economy. And the creator uh -huh. economy is, yes, of course, basic, think of it basically as a whole bunch of technologies and capabilities and platforms are now in place and have been for 10 to 20 years that allows for a robust middle class of, com of creators. I'm so part of the creator economy right now. Well, you we're are. Doing we're doing it right now. We're yeah. doing it right like, now. <laughs> this was not available uh, to people as easily as it is now. And yeah. what does that mean? Well, if you, it then changes who, how, where, how often, all kinds of creative, informative, educational content can be created. And that's what I've been working with Estonia and One area we focused on first was esports, which I told them I'm not qualified, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I know enough to I be dangerous. <laughs> and I, yeah, no, no, no. I said, but I know somebody, and um, so Marcus Marcus Howard was who I recommended, and he did a terrific job uh, working with the with the e residency program in Estonia. Uh, on top of that, I do some work with uh, a, a pal of mine. Uh, down in uh, down in Kenya, and uh, with Thera, and, and her work is way outside of my media end, but I bring the entrepreneurship side of my of my knowledge base and my experience. Uh, and she's working with uh, young young people across Africa, uh, and she believes that an entrepreneurial zeal is going to save the save the continent. Mm -hmm. And I totally I love and believe in her. Uh, I love and believe in what she's saying. I totally get that. And she's been doing it, especially saying things like, go go be a farmer. Mm -hmm. That this is the this is where the opportunity is. And they teach and pass on. So I've been working with with them in Kenya and Nairobi and uh, and outside in the in the rural areas. Uh and Do you have any experience uh, in Latin America, by the way, or no? No, I haven't, but I'd love to. I have Last to one I'll give is Nepal. To in Nepal. I've done something in Nepal with the uh, King's College in uh -huh. uh, in Kathmandu, which is awesome. Uh -huh. Awesome to be able to say Kathmandu. Yes. The, uh, uh, but that those are ones that I've done some international, but not with the the only one that's with government is with Estonia. Uh -huh. um, I tend to find the government wants ribbon cuttings and press releases and that's all nonsense uh the estonian ones man do they move fast i love them so whatever it is you had in your head about your mythology about government it doesn't have to be that way go work with the estonian people that their their government is fast moving creative it's really interesting yeah yeah no estonia is really a role model in terms of uh digitalization and entrepreneurship as well yeah. um I have to ask as well. Um, so, from your experience working in the entrepreneurship ecosystem of developing countries, do you think, or do you, have you seen that there are um, special barriers there, uh, or in common barriers among them that differ from those develop those of the developed countries, or no? Um, yeah, I would say uh, there's another one. Uh, I worked with a student. Uh, she is fantabulous. Uh, it's her venture is humans to humans. And she actually is working on the barrier she saw, which is mm -hmm. in developing countries, entrepreneurs are hardworking, they identify a market, they are, you know, building a business, they're taking that risk, all those things, but they just don't have access to people like you and me, um, advisors who are, you know, can tell them things about markets because they've been down that road before. Oh, hey, here's your 
problem. Oh, I've seen this kind of thing before. And what she does is she connects top students in elite business programs mm -hmm. with entrepreneurs in, em in emerging markets. This is a so great thing. Oh, it's a sensational program. And she's um, she's built it from nothing. Uh, she's a Cornell graduate and now is uh, working as an investment banker. But this is her love, is, uh -huh. this, is this venture. Um, and she has a great team running it and they put a cohort together. But that's the barrier. The barrier is... A network, you would say it. It's first. a network of other entrepreneurs, uh, but it's also access to... I, I don't know if it's like now not it's knowledge, but it's a different kind of knowledge. It's not a paper you can read about it, how to market it's the game knowledge, right? Yeah, it's, it's like practical it's, knowledge. It's a like, practicum, yeah, exactly. It's the practical like the game, like the insider. Because I think it's a I don't I don't know if I guess it happens in the same way in the US, but for example, in Peru, um the we, we call it the ent entrepreneurial ring, you know, it's a ring, it's a it's a it's oh yeah closed, you know, like uh, do you if you're in, you know, but if you're outside, you have no idea, you know? And well, I teach my students, I teach my students how you get into that ring. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, because that's part of it. A lot of people yeah. go, oh, it's about the great idea. No, it's, and not. it's about it's the about, connections. Who you know, who well, can, you know, advise you. Well, it's a little bit of that. It. There's certainly a little bit of that. But I will tell you, the one that gets them every time is that unstoppable force. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going, oh, you have this idea you're working on? No, actually, I built it. They're like, okay. And they're going, okay. I thought you had an appointment in 20 minutes. Yeah, not anymore. I want to see what you're working on. That that's that you're now you're like you're different. And once okay. they see you're on it and you're working on stuff, they don't just want to help you. They want they want to really help you. How can I jump in and oh, let me put you in touch with so and so. And I do that kind of stuff. And my students are like, Well, why don't you put me in touch with the founder of MTV? I said, because you don't have anything to give them. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, they're a real person. That's not just there to me to connect you and they give you wisdom like they're giving it out, you know? No, mm -hmm. it, it you have to bring them something that makes them go, oh, that's insane. I love being a part of this. Let me help you. Mm -hmm. They gain from helping you and you gain, especially from their help. And that is this sort of secret society of entrepreneurs they want to see doers. They don't want ideas. They don't want somebody who's just smart. Mm -hmm. There's tons of them. Yeah. Like I want someone who's crazy and doing it, <laughs> you know, and once you get that, then you're in. Not okay. always, but, but a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that would be, you're right. In developing countries, especially there's not as much of it. And, That's, um, and this is what I was going to tell you, because I think in developing countries that, that, that the, one of the biggest barrier would be actually to get to talk to these people, even to get rejected, you know? Like, right. it's okay if you reject me, but just having the possibility to talk to you and see if you like my, if you like what I did, if I already did it or not, you know? Like, just having this possibility of sitting with you and chatting with you and, you, you know, showing you what I want, what, what I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is oh, and I will tell you, entrepreneurs, you. Uh, by and large, entrepreneurs are incredibly optimistic, wonderful people. And, but they're busy. <laughs> I mean, whatever most people, normal human beings think busy is, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. are way over, system is over capacity and they're okay with it. For them to make time into that system, it better be high value, like it's impactful mm -hmm. or really interesting. So it gets me on curiosity. It gets my emotions. Uh, and that's, so that's what you, like in developing countries is not just, oh, I have this modest problem. Can you put me in touch with the big cheese? No, you don't need the big cheese. You need you need somebody who knows that really specific area. Let's solve that. And then when you get to the really big cheese project, now let's bring in the big cheese because somebody like that would say, oh man, let's solve that together. Do you have this? How do you do this? And you're like, okay, I'm taking notes. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Everybody wins. Great. I have to, I think this leads us now to the third, the third point, third very important point of this talk. Uh, that is 
what can we do or how can entrepreneurship education or entrepreneurship educators um, help entrepreneurship students or students to, to, to jump these barriers, to overcome these barriers that we just talked about? You mentioned quite a, quite a bit of barriers, you know, like being uh, the socioeconomical, one of the most important ones, um, gender as well, and this uh, diversity thing as well. Uh, so I'm going to give a very specific prescription. One uh -huh. is, is that we need to stop teaching entrepreneurship as this mechanical business plan driven process. As need, I, I think, I think that academic teaching and entrepreneurship should, I mean, it's, it's, I think they're completely opposite in a way, you know? Right. Like, and so <laughs> there are great programs. Don't, I'm not putting them down. It's very rigorous. Uh -huh. It's really good, but really a business plan is something that's easier for the professor to grade. Yeah. And that's why I think it perpetuates. It's mm -hmm. breaking down in the United States, more and more using effectuation, uh, the work of Sarah Saravathi out of uh, the University of Virginia Darden School. And mm -hmm. she is identified a much more nuanced, get her done, go build the damn thing kind of approach mm -hmm. with, with uh, a pedagogy that goes with it. And that, when you teach that, it changes who feels like they belong in the room. So it answers, I think, is it somebody who's really good at finance and accounting and um, maybe, but maybe they don't know that. It doesn't set that as the bar. And then once you clear it, okay, you can be an entrepreneur. No, it says everybody can try being an entrepreneur, which leads to the second one don't i have uh friends of mine in entrepreneurship programs at some really uh, um, esteemed university and they say oh yeah we have this really high placement i'm like placement yeah that everybody graduated our entrepreneurship is employed i'm like that's failure <laughs> in my mind like you should have zero placement everybody yes. went and started their thing yeah you, you uh, should you have know, founders or, not employees yeah, exactly <laughs> and part of the problem is they teach the theory and they teach the process and then they do projects mm -hmm. and they're not real and to me i would say there are a growing number of universities here in the us in particular and i'm seeing more around the world that are saying start it while you're here start it while you're here because if it doesn't make it because we said it's the failure business mm -hmm. you're fine we still put mm -hmm. a square on your head and we give you a diploma and we uh, you know <laughs> We, we, you can move on in your career without, without harm. Uh, but don't do it as a project. Don't do it as something you're gonna put on your CV or your resume to say, oh, I started this thing as a student and isn't that cool? You aren't serious. I mean, ser my take is they're not that different than the kid who didn't do that project. They just did an interesting project maybe. Mm -hmm. The one who threw themselves into it and is able to sit in front of me and I'm ready to hire them two years down the road and they say, well, look, my grades aren't that good because I spent all this time on this venture. That's, that's who I want. Yeah, that's the one I want. <laughs> to me, there are more employable. They're a different kind of student in the end. They're higher success as individuals and as people and as our society measures than somebody who had all good grades, did this science project of a, a venture I want them to be in a real venture where they're terrified, like where where they're thrilled and terrified at the same time. Uh, and they went really fast and maybe let up the gas on their other grades. I know that's a violation of what academia teaches, but I think grades are grades are nice. They're just not real. Um, they're not an indicator of success. That's the thing. <laughs> they're not. And no. There's a huge discussion as well as how, of how the grading system or, or uh, the educational grading system should be reshaped, transformed to actually meet the needs and the reality of, you know, the society we live in today. You know, we are still grading people as we used to grade them 100 years ago in the university. That's right. So, you know, like uh, some some of those things, some of those criteria don't apply anymore. Today. We don't need to memorize things That's because true. we have Google, you know, we have now, even we have now chat GPT who can be your, you know, our, our assistant. So what, um, 
what should wait more, I think, in the, the, the grading or how much value you give to a student is like, what they can do, you know, like what can you do with their lack of resource, with little resource you have? What are you able to do? And, and, and you what did you do? To? What did uh, you do? Exactly. Like, oh, I launched this business and it did this and this and this. Oh, did it make any money? No, we couldn't figure out how to make money. Okay, we know how to do that. Come yeah. join our company. <laughs> we'll figure out the how's it make money. But you went and built something out of nothing. That's good. That's great. That's, we want to. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Yeah, and the, uh, it, the okay. stories associated with that are terrific. So that'd be the one I'd say is um, huh? is I would change how entrepreneurship is taught. I'd maybe even move it out of the business school as much as possible, make it available to people who are not thinking business. They're mm -hmm. an artist. Uh, they're uh, you know um, in policy. There we need more entrepreneurial thinking yes. and more entrepreneurial endeavors than ever before. And then I would say, and make it accessible by changing that it's not about business plans and a process of building up to when you launch. You launch early, often, learn as much as you can and do it while you're on campus. True, true. And one question, this is for you, maybe. Uh, maybe you have thought about it before. If, if uh, traditional education uh, and traditional grading and traditional uh, business education, business plans don't work for entrepreneurship. Uh, what would be a way to kind of make it less uncertain? If is there a way of making it, of making entrepreneurship less uncertain? Uh, because of course, I am totally in with you that you know you should just go and build the damn thing. <laughs> I agree with you on that. But um, is there a way on which uh, you could have training on like um that i don't know training that would lead you somehow to a bigger probability of success or no i don't have an i have my answer to that which is an emotional answer yeah is, that's it that's good uh the emotional answer is i wouldn't take out the uncertainty it is um it is a business of uncertainty you need to yes. get comfortable being uncomfortable if you're going to be in, in the world of entrepreneurship it is not about certainty that's about management where I know the outcome, I work and I manage to the outcome. Mm -hmm. Great. And then there'll be uncertain moments in there. Your job is to move it off that uncertainty back onto reliable and 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 certain. Entrepreneurship is almost like injecting uncertainty into it once you've gotten to certain points. Then eventually it's established business, Elon Musk. And you need to get out of it and let it be a real business that's managed by people who are managing to an objective. Uh, and that's different than entrepreneuring. Entrepreneuring is, uh, and I like using it as a verb, uh, is uh, or gerund in that case, right? Uh, where you're, you're doing this thing and the thing you're doing is all about the uncertainty. So on one level, my emotional is, no, I, I would keep the uncertainty there um, and I would keep, um, I would, so how do I fix, I don't know, <laughs> how would I fix? Uh, it's a big question, it's right? A good question. <laughs> it's not mine to, it's not mine to do, but if it were, I think I would try a bunch of different things and then see what the outcomes are. I would take a page from um, the entrepreneuring, uh, the entrepreneurial thinking of effectuation and say, okay, so I don't know. And I'm okay with not knowing, but we want to figure out how we can get better outcomes. Um, so let's try three parallel or four or five parallel different systems and see how do they play out? What were some of the elements of this one that I can move over here and enhance this one? And uh, that was horrible. Let, uh, let's stop doing that. And maybe even it comes back around to there's different styles. Everybody learns differently. So Maybe you have style choices. I'm the organized, this is not a true statement at all about me. I am the most organized and process oriented person who wants to do a venture. Okay, that's not me, but there's somebody like that and they should have a way that they can get into entrepreneurial approaches and environments because they're needed. Um, somebody else who's on the creative side, yes, that's me, um, where, I'm really comfortable, probably too comfortable with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, and the line I use that my business partner used to say is, Sean, go get coffee. 
Yeah. Which, when I tell my students that, they think, oh, that is so dismissive. I'm like, no, because I know it's a it's code for we need to we need to have a process and we don't <laughs> we don't need you in the room. Get out. Go get do, do something you can do, like go get coffee. So I'll go get coffee, not because I'm being scooted away, but because I'm being scooted away. And yeah. I'm I'm more distraction and I'm doing this sort of ideating aspect of of the entrepreneurial process when no we already know the thing we need to build we need mm -hmm. to come up with a repeatable success formula uh -huh. at least for now uh and that's when people like me need to need to recognize that and and step out so maybe there's different channels uh based on learning styles mm -hmm. for entrepreneurship yes. Yes. Uh, that would be that would be terrific for somebody to figure that out yeah, that's you're you're right. I can actually, yeah, not only learning styles, but as well personality styles in general. No, yeah, because I, th there are people who feel I, yeah. I think I am on your team that I'm, I feel very comfortable with uncertainty. But I also have, I mean, I come from, I have. I watched how we got ready for this podcast, and exactly. I'm going, oh, we are the <laughs> same. We are the same. Yeah. Yes, oh my God. No, yeah. but I also. Um, I mean, I have colleagues. I, I mean, I, I come from academia. No, I have colleagues that are like they are yeah. gantt oriented plan oriented like they can't they can't they, they have everything organized and you know like they they need because they need this they are like this and they feel comfortable like this i don't feel so comfortable with uh you know like uh, lines too and, much structure and i'm out exactly yeah. i am yeah. uh, so they, not see, my, we're, my we're, but, we're yeah, uh, uh, brother and we, sister on this one right <laughs> yeah so Here's, yes. here's the thing I have this. Uh, so I'll give you a nomenclature that I use. It's, it's made up. I have no research to prove it. But I think there's three styles that I've seen of entrepreneuring. Um, and there's a visionary, outward looking, really comfortable with uncertainty. They're usually entertaining. Right. Yeah, OK. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then the other person is an operator. Yes. Their arms crossed. They're looking at what the is J, it? The J I, personality now they're type, trying like, to figure like, out, yeah. but they're not inflexible. They're really flexible. They're flexible to go off to the sides and pull in so that they can create a process. Like if we're going to do this, we need to have not just I need to like as some obsession. Mm -hmm. It's they're keen to figure out the puzzle of, OK, we don't know what that is. I'm OK with just saying we don't know. But we do know these, and we're going to do them in this order and this process, and that's an operator. And then the third one is the builder. It's someone who just wants to be the inventor. They want to build the thing. And if it's a, so it's a restaurant, that's the chef, mm -hmm. okay, who maybe has a hard time managing their own life. That's that's okay. <laughs> as long as they can get there close enough to on time so we can have food for our customers. The the um the visionary is the person out the front. Ah, it's so good to see you, Viviana. We haven't seen you in so long. What was it a week? And you see, I'm giving them all that outward and love, you know. And then, oh, am I right? The window, the table by the window. Let's see what we can get for you. And we get. Meanwhile, there's someone over on the side. Stefan is the one I always like to use. And Stefan <laughs> is saying, okay, we need to get, we need to change the wait staff because Sean just moved, our one of our best customers to the table with our newest staff member and we're we are not doing that uh <laughs> we are and so stefan goes over and changes so those three are can be three individuals or it can be kind of coupled mm -hmm. especially in a startup i do not believe there's anybody who's good at all three because that just yes. defies odds so i can be a builder i've done this where i like doing the work and a visionary those are good my mm -hmm. my dominant is visionary because mm -hmm. I'll do the builder for a while and then I'll get bored. Because same. <laughs> dominant, right? Yeah. But never operator. Good yes, God. No get same. me an operator, please. Somebody it's get me out of here. Not but I my... think I think for an entrepreneur, it's important to recognize their, their, their entrepreneurial style. Uh, because right. uh in that way you can you can build a better team, right? And 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 I think entrepreneurial teams thrive oh, the teams more diverse are the they are. If if you oh, if yeah. you can get those three profiles together in a team and then you are super powerful. Then you are. You are it was. The world. It was at our conference that a Ben from Belgium. Did you see his presentation? Uh, maybe not. I think he might have been the day before. 
but he was talking about five varieties and i really liked it i can't remember them all maybe i can look it up uh but he was talking about a couple others like a designer and a um and someone who's um who's looking at um uh, other elements uh, on this i think the three holds up but i i'm open to you know it could be i'm missing a couple other elements so uh a I mean, designer is one that i always thought about yeah do you need them all the time no but you don't need the visionary all the time either so you can tell the both of them you too designer visionary yeah, exactly. go, go get coffee <laughs> so true yeah true. yeah okay so to close all this conversation that we've had i would this like has been to great thank you yeah no i would like you to um just uh close with uh let's say five tips to um entrepreneurial educators um for yeah let's for actually advancing entrepreneurial education and actually uh yeah uh, trying to tackle the barriers uh of entrepreneurship for the current barriers for entrepreneurship for students all right, good. You're going to give me five. Look at you. You're giving me structure here. So number okay. one, yeah, no, number one is what I did, uh, what I gave in that presentation yeah. uh, is, is that entrepreneurship has become pervasive in university across the, across, across the globe. And it's very general and that's good. But if you want to get even better, get specialized. So if you're in an entre, if you're teaching entrepreneurship, and in the business school or not, it doesn't matter. Go off and find the other program across campus and only go with the best programs because then you'll get even better school uh, students and you then have to transform how you teach that entrepreneurship. I'll get to that in a second. The other one is if you're not in entrepreneurship, can I make this the same one, number one? Huh? If you're not in entrepreneurship, go across campus to the business school or wherever there may be entrepreneurship and bring it back. Talk, mm -hmm. Say, hey, how can I work with you to help my students here in the design school or in the architecture school or in the policy school? Uh, because we need more entrepreneurship in every one of those types of programs and schools. So that's number one is, is to bring entrepreneurship to a specialization uh, on the campus. Two is what we talked about. Make it so they start it while they're there. Mm -hmm. Maybe even mechanism that you get an extra year if you're already working a venture we keep you in the safe zone you're here on campus we love you we have resources it's a blanket. <laughs> yeah it's a big blanket to help not money or any of those other things like oh we will take your business and nice great do that too but i would say just give them more time mm -hmm. give them more time and more resources so invite them to stay uh maybe a fellowship um something along those lines that's about them as human beings and i think you will increase both the volume the success rate and more importantly i think in all of this is who because then you take away from a as a university that um uh ability to fail you're giving the ability to fail for one year yes. to uh to somebody who's got a deserving venture have put in the work not they wrote a paper about a thing they might do no, they're already doing it. They're unstoppable and you're going to help them continue to be unstoppable uh, and keep them on the, on the campus. So that'd be number two. Number three, I would say is to look at entrepreneurship as a creative endeavor, mm -hmm. not a mechanized process, not all the same, because then you're open to the students doing it in a way that will make you, I, I say these words, I, I think you're wrong, I'll be happy if you prove me wrong. No, I won't. I like being right. We all like being right. But I will love you, dear student, if you prove me wrong and you can stick my nose in it and poke me in the eye about it later and we'll laugh because you went off and succeeded. Let them try things. Again, while they're on campus, it's a safer way for them to do it. But do, do, do. So make it so they launch on, on campus uh now i'm gonna go number four i guess i would say is uh getting more of these kinds of conversations would be a good thing uh little innovation happens in out of the way places there's a line i teach in the in, a, in my innovation course that says the future is here it's just not evenly distributed it's happening somewhere and you maybe didn't hear of it or it's over here in this odd niche area but 
the conversation is come talk to me about what you're doing there and people tend to bring it into their own world like watching a good movie right oh that could have been me huh? yeah i was destined to be a superhero no no i'm not but i can learn from it and that's that's a really interesting way to to uh open our minds to new and different ways is to have these kinds of conversations uh and then i'm gonna just do a shout out to uh adm and the and stuttgart and uh it's getting it's getting people like you and me to just have this creative collision um it was a collision actually <laughs> it was a collision isn't it uh, I give as an example there, I'm from Jersey City in uh, right outside New York, but I went to New York, I went to high school in New York City. I love my New York City. But why did New York City grow and be this mammoth thing? But New Jersey's over here and it's successful and big and I love Jersey and Jersey City. Why didn't that become the Mecca? Because at one point, uh, Alexander Hamilton said that actually is what was going to happen. There's more room for expansion on the New Jersey side that the bet was back then in the 1700s that that would be where in industry and commerce and banking and everything would be on that side because there's more room to grow. Mm -hmm. But it happened in New York City. And there's been some studies that it's because everybody's crowded together and banging into each other. And these creative collisions are happening literally on the street. I bump into <laughs> somebody. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm not because I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> Let me help you up because otherwise you'd think I'm a jerk and I am. And then I help you up and we talk and magic happens. Mm -hmm. It wasn't planned. It's humans at its, be at its best. And the next thing is, hey, you come from this industry and you're doing what? Wow, that's really interesting. Those kinds of collisions happen only when we get humans in spaces that are uh yeah. you know e even digital spaces yes. where where they constantly are able to you know knock around ideas uh, twist them turn them etc cetera, etc cetera. so that, that was my five i got five great five those are great five <laughs> Well, Shang, it has been great having you in the podcast. I'm really looking forward to continue uh, our interactions and our discussions and our oh, crazy man, you are ideas so easy neighbor. to talk to. This is <laughs> terrible. I will, I could stay I on here for another so hour. Alike, you know, I think it's because we're so much alike and that, yeah, you know, we bit, are yeah. there. Danger, you know. danger, danger. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, so you can end uh, this and say, hey, Sean, go get coffee. <laughs> yeah, I won't. I won't. They, they will probably tell us both to go get coffee. Like, oh, Sean right. and Vivi, go do get it. coffee Let's together. Do it. Yeah, <laughs> totally. OK. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you have any uh, final remarks, final words. And uh, if people want to contact you, where can they, where can they find you? Or uh, I don't know, where can uh, they run, jump into my, you? My easiest email address is startups at syr.edu, which is Syracuse University, uh, mm -hmm. syr.edu. Uh, that's probably uh, if somebody's got something. I, I also, you know, I'm putting it out there, so I might get spammed. Uh, best one is to just check me out on LinkedIn, uh, reach out to me there, and then I can you can see the kinds of things that I've done and doing. Uh, some of it, most of it, I keep it pretty up to date, and then I can do the same when you reach out, say hi to me on LinkedIn. So that's probably the best way. Great. Thank you for listening to the Innovation in Higher Education podcast. Follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our newsletter to not miss any episode. You can also find us on Instagram and TikTok as at Innovation in Higher Ed. Cheers! <laughs>